Good morning, friends. I hope your day's starting out well. My day's going pretty good, and Sausage is joining us this morning. Let's see. Say hello, Sausage. Sausage, do you want to say hello? Obviously, he's very excited about everything that we're doing today. But Sausage, we're talking about Samson today. Sausage continues to be unexcited. So, we'll have to get excited for him. Today we are talking about Samson, who is one of the judges. Now, a lot's happened since we left Deborah uh, yesterday, and that's simply a lot because there's a lot that happens in Judges. Hundreds of, you know, hundreds of years have passed through the period of this book, and there's lots of different judges, but there's also lots of different failures. So remember that pattern that we talked about, where men and uh, women turn to God, run from God, worship idols, God sends someone to, to, to persecute Israel, they repent, they turn back to God, God rescues them, then the pattern repeats itself. So that happens quite a few times. We go through Gideon, who is one of the, uh, starts out as a really good judge, but then has a lot of failures, and then his sons really mess things up. We've got several other minor judges that come through that are great to read about, and then we get to the the period where Samson is. Now, Samson, when Samson is there, the uh, people of Israel are being persecuted by the Philistines. And they, the Philistines are going to be around for a while. They actually kind of arrive on the scene afterwards. So they weren't originally there when they landed in Canaan. But they came by boat and started building cities there in, is in the area around Israel after the Israelites had come. So they come after the Israelites do. And they are persecuting the Israelites, you know, taking their their wealth, attacking them. But at the same time, the Israelites are living with this new group of people, and they're not, you know, there's there's not outright warfare yet between them. Now, that being said, the Isra the Philistines have a better handle on how to make iron weapons than the Hebrew people do. So they have a real military advantage there. Now we get to Samson. So Samson's parents are farmers. Just normal, you know, run-of-the-mill people using the land that God gave them to make a living for their families. And then one day this angel of the Lord shows up and this angel of the Lord tells them that, um, uh, you know, you've, you're gonna, you're gonna, what's the word? Let's see. Do, 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 do. The angel of the Lord says, behold, um, well, first he comes to the wife and then to the husband. I'm reading in chapter, chapter 13 now. Um, and, uh, okay, right. There was a certain man of Zora of the tribe of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, you are barren and have not born children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Therefore, be careful. And this is crucial for our understanding of Samson's narrative. Therefore, be careful and drink no wine or strong drink and eat, no, eat nothing unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb. And he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. So now, uh, that's the background for Samson. Now, Samson is born. He grows up to be a man of incredible strength. Um, and he is called to be a Nazarite. His parents treat him as a Nazarite. That means that his hair isn't cut. Probably drew some pretty amazing dreads. If you uh, think about how it was, either it was very tightly braided or it was dreaded. Um, or And he's not supposed to drink wine. He's not supposed to anything touch anything unclean. And that includes dead things. Now, here's the thing about all of this. These Nazarite rules and customs are supposed to set a person apart so that they act in a holy way. And Samson's whole story is one where God gives him great strength, but he acts in a way that's very unholy over and over again. He breaks his Nazarite vows. He frequently uh, goes out and finds um, wives and prostitutes that aren't, uh, you know, <laughs> it's a failure in every way. Um, so the, his character does not reflect the vows that he does not keep. Uh, his character reflects, I guess, the vows that he does not keep, and that he doesn't. His character is not good in either of the vows. But still, the Lord gives him strength to make him a judge. And uh, now, with that great strength, if he had kept his character clean, we don't know 
what would have come of that if he had been pure of heart as well of great strength um the story would have ended differently perhaps but his story is a tragedy right so samson in the chapter 14 we get to these puns and these parables that samson tells he makes the poems here and the story is that he falls in love with a philistine woman now the text tells us that the the narrator tells us that this is of god because god's going to use this to punish the philistines and so he falls in love with this Philistine woman, and he goes out to see her, um, and he's visiting with her, and he has to travel back and forth. The first time that he's visiting with her, he went down, starting in verse 5, Then Samson went down with his father and mother to Timnah, and they came to the vineyards of Timnah, and behold, a young lion came roaring towards him. Then the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and although he had nothing in his hand, he tore the lion in pieces as one tears a young goat. He did not tell his father or his mother what he had done. Then he went down and talked with the woman, and she was right in Samson's eyes. So he engages himself to this Philistine woman, and he, in the meantime, kills this lion and casts it, uh, casts it off the path. Some days later, he returned to take her, and he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion, and behold, there was a swarm of bees in the body of the lion and honey. He scraped it out with his hands and went on eating as he went. And he came to his father and mother and gave some to them and they ate. He did not tell them that he had scraped the honey from the carcass of the lion. Now this is crucial because he has just made himself horribly unclean. That you're not supposed to come in contact with any dead thing. And to eat honey in a carcass would from the very, you know, for every Israelite that would have made them unclean. So he's just made himself and his parents ritually unclean with what he does. Then he goes on, and they go down to get his uh, to get his bride. His father went down to the woman, and Samson prepared a feast there, as so for the young men as the young men used to do. As soon as the people saw him, they brought thirty companions to be with him. And Samson said to them, "Now let me now put a riddle to you. If you can tell me what it is within seven days of the feast and find it out, then I will give you thirty linen garments and thirty changes of clothes." But if you cannot tell me what it is, then you shall give me thirty linen garments and thirty changes of clothes. And they said to him, Put your riddle that we may hear it. And he said to them, Out of the eater came something to eat. Out of the strong came something sweet. And in three days they could not solve the riddle. On the fourth day they said to Samson's wife, Entice your husband to tell us what the riddle is, lest we burn you and your father's house with fire. Have you invited us here to impoverish us? And Samson's wife wept over him and said, You only hate me, you do not love me. You have put a riddle to my people and you have not told me what it is. Oh, you're so mean to me, Samson. And he said to her, Behold, I have not told my father nor my mother, and shall I tell you? She wept before him the seven days she the, of the feast. And on the seventh day he told her, because she pressed him hard. Then she told the riddle to her people, and the men of the city said to him on the seventh day before the sun went down, What is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? And he said to them, If you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have found out my riddle. So these these puns, are, these poetic puns, uh, bring play to a very dark situation. As Samson realizes that if, if not in deed, in word, his wife has been unfaithful to him. And he realizes as well that these these Philistines are cheating. And um, then the Spirit of the Lord rushes on him. And he goes down to Ashkan, in another Philistine town. And he strikes down 30 men of the town, took their spoil, and uses their garments to pay back these other men. Who he had told the riddle. In his hot anger, he went back to his father's house. And so Samson's wife is given to one of the companions who was supposed to be his best man. And that's the end of that very sad story for Samson and for their young love, which failed horribly. So for us, what do we get out of these texts? We get this beautiful story of Samson, who is one of the more exciting and definitely one of the more described judges in the book of Judges. Probably the most famous judge, quite frankly. But we see two things in his story, and we'll see, we see God's grace at work. Because here is a man who is very broken. We like to think of him as a heroic character. But there's no way we can really look at him as a, a pure and heroic character. Because his actions are so flawed. Um, and yet God uses him 
to rescue the Hebrew people and to bring God glory. And we see at the very end that Samson uh, sees God's grace in a profound way as he repents, blinded, shackled to in a temple. And he tears down the whole temple uh, to bring glory to, uh, to, tears down the temple of Dagon uh, to once more get revenge on the Philistines. So Samson's story is a tragic story of revenge. It's a story of God using a broken man to bring his purposes into play. Um, and it's a story of God, in the end, rescuing a broken man and showing him his love. Um, it's also the story of God seeing a woman who's without child and who can't have a child, and he gives her a special child. So we see that theme over and over again with um, with her, with, uh, in a way, Noah's mother, with, uh, in a way... Well, definitely with Hannah, and then we see it with Elizabeth, and all of it points us to Jesus. And so, it points us to Jesus, who is our king, who has the strength of Samson, the, the power of Yahweh, but yet also has the character and the holiness of Yahweh. And we see that he uses his strength in a profoundly different way than Samson does. And so, in a way, Jesus runs a counter-message to Samson, because his heart is pure, as well as his hands are strong. And, you know, so a bruised reed he does not break. Anyways, for us, all of these things show us the beauty of God, God's great power to redeem our broken situations and to use us, our strengths and our weaknesses, for his glory. So what strengths and weaknesses are you hoping to see God work with today? Where do you need to repent and come to him for healing? Where do you need to be acting trusting that he'll meet you there, um, like uh, he met Deborah and Barak, and give you victory. We lot we can pray for today. It's the election in the states, and that weighs heavy on my heart. Um, but we know that God's in control, and so we can celebrate that together, even as we pray and worship together. So let's do that now. Father, we praise you so much for your love. We praise you for your holiness. We praise you for your spirit who dwells within us. And your spirit gives us a strength that's far more than Samson's strength. It is the strength to be holy. It is the strength to resist the devil and to cause him to flee. It is the strength to humble ourselves and to be in your presence, enjoying all of your beauty and all of your glory. You draw us near to you that we can pray now and that you hear our prayers. Father, we thank you for this beautiful story, and we thank you for Samson, how he draws us in, and how we can reflect on his character and recognize in his flaws our own. And we thank you that you use us, flaws and all, for your glory and for your kingdom. Help us to be bold, strong and courageous, staying true to your word as we walk as your people in a broken world. We pray for the United States during this election. We pray for peace instead of war, instead of violence and riots. We pray for um, your will to be done in a gentle way. And Lord, we ask for wisdom and your blessing on that nation. That instead of brokenness, there would be healing. Instead of despair, there would be restoration. And we pray particularly for those in the nation that um, are really hurting right now. We pray for the places hit most strongly by COVID-19. We pray for those um, persons who are caught up in the QAnon cult. We pray, Father, for a healing and a restoration, for a, a truth to burn brighter than the lies of the world. And, Father, we pray for Canada, that you would give us peace. And we do pray for Alberta as they continue to struggle with uh, really getting things under control, and for Quebec. Um with COVID, and we do pray, Father, for the world itself, around the world, as COVID continues to ravage nation after nation. Um, we pray for uh, your restoration, and we pray, Father, for a um, vaccine to come soon. And we pray, Father, for leaders to have wisdom and grace. We pray, Lord, for our community here, for the children that are under great stress, we think and we know that uh, high schoolers, I was speaking with a high school teacher and a high school psych, and they were just saying how difficult things are for, for all of the students this year, how stressful and how confusing they are. 
And Lord, we pray for your shield of protection to be over them. We pray for your grace and your love and your delight in them to surround them. We pray that in this broken season that the gospel would be speaking into their hearts in a profound and wonderful way. And that for the high schoolers that we know and love, that you would give us words um, and actions that show them how much we love them and care for them. Lord, we pray for those that are waiting for surgery that they would get in. We pray for those that are mourning loved ones who have passed, that you would be their comfort. We pray, Father, for our broken um, yeah, for those that are facing brokenness in their lives and in their health, that you would be their healer. And Lord, we thank you that you love us. Give us peace, Lord. Peace is your people in a broken age. Peace that comes from knowing that you are on the throne. And peace that gives us the words to say and the means to say them well. That others may see and know the beauty of the Lamb that was slain, who sits on the throne. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, Christ our great, precious Redeemer. May we lean into you, Lord, as we walk this day this broken and um, uh, in this broken and very confused age. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, friends, thank you for joining me. I hope you're enjoying the Book of Judges. Uh, if you've got any questions or suggestions or thoughts or prayer requests, feel free to put them in the comments. God bless you all. Bye-bye.